afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Donna Sullivan. I'm the president of the Danube uh, Institute. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the latest uh, discussion of political argument, political theory, political philosophy. I think there are other names, but we can be rest with them for the moment. Um, another such discussion. The topic um, is an interesting one, as you see. Tell me your story, and then I'll listen to your argument, political rhetoric in times of distrust. Um, our speaker, um, well, I will first introduce the two commentators, and um, the two commentators, as you see on, the, on my far right here, is um, uh, David Martin Jones, known to you, some of you already, because he's the head of research here at the Danube Institute, um, and his intellectual and political interests range fairly widely from the conduct of war and uh, the preparation for war um, to um, such questions as uh, um, the, the kind of liberal society we have in which the government is constantly demanding that we improve our moral behavior. Um, that secondly, um, Ferenc Horscher is again well known to this audience because he's one of the most distinguished political philosophers in Budapest. He studied at Oxford, um, uh, Brussels, Budapest. He's the head of the Institute for Political Theory and uh, an advisor on, on uh, philosophy at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. But he is known in particular, I think, in recent years for his association with the work of the English political philosopher Roger Scruton, and who's played a great role in bringing Roger Scruton's ideas and arguments to the Hungarian public. But our principal speaker today is Professor James M uh, Murphy. Um, he is the founder and faculty director of the program in politics, philosophy, and economics at Dartmouth College, one of the very distinguished Ivy League universities in the United States. Um, and I will leave it to him to describe his approach. But among his topics of interest are Utopia and its critics, the foundations of political thought, the ethics of war and peace, and profits on trial. So I think we are in for an afternoon of extremely interesting debate, argument, and discussion. And it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor Murphy to begin our discussion. Well, thank, thank you very much for coming, and I want to thank, of course, Ferenc Horcher, my, my friend, uh, uh, for inviting me and suggesting this topic, and uh, Mr. Sullivan, and, and of course, Melissa, for, for organizing it. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in, in your beautiful city. Um, okay, well, I'll begin with a puzzle about belief in evidence. If human beings were simply rational animals, we would revise our factual beliefs readily in the face of credible new information. But social and political psychologists have demonstrated repeatedly in experimental settings that we tend to maintain certain false beliefs despite compelling evidence to the contrary. We resist surrendering particular factual beliefs because our beliefs are interconnected to form webs so that a threat to one belief becomes a threat to the entire web. Some of these webs are scientific theories, which explains why scientists are often reluctant to abandon a beautiful theory because of one ugly fact. Other times, these webs are deeply personal. Many of our moral and political beliefs are woven into narratives about who we are. And since we find these narratives to be meaningful, we're, we're, we are reluctant to abandon them even when they become frayed by stubborn facts. Our beliefs are resistant to change because they're embedded in the stories we tell about ourselves. More than just rational animals who seek the truth, we are also storytelling animals who seek meaning. We crave stories which aim at meaning just as much as we crave theories which aim at knowledge. While popular myths 
often take the form of so-called conspiracy theories, they are actually nothing more than stories that claim to find meaningful and sinister patterns in official behavior that suggest coordinated deception. And indeed, there's always enough solid evidence of official misconduct to provide fuel for such stories. For many people, conspiracy stories are more than a match for scientific evidence and expert argument. Meaningful stories usually trump meaningless facts. Studies of internet culture demonstrate that compelling but false stories travel faster and farther than any number of expert arguments. Confronting a meaningful story with an argument has proven largely futile, in part because it represents what philosophers call a category mistake. Offering an argument to refute a compelling story is like answering a question about cooking with a chemistry theorem. The only way to defeat a false story is with a true story. False political beliefs, such as beliefs about election outcomes, can pose a direct threat to democratic government and the rule of law. To address this threat, political rhetoric ought to encompass both the logic of argument and the poetics of narrative. The culture of argument has enjoyed greater prestige than the culture of storytelling ever since the rise of the ancient Greek sophists. Argument is now the lingua franca of law, public policy, and science, while storytelling is associated with entertainment and childhood. Ever since Aristotle devoted his rhetoric, his treatise The Rhetoric, to political argument, and his treatise The Poetics to stories, scholars of political rhetoric have discussed only arguments, even though people talking politics have always told stories. Rhetoric claims to be the study of persuasive speech, yet nothing is more persuasive than storytelling. Social psychologists have long studied rhetorical persuasion, but have only recently turned to narrative persuasion. Political philosophers in the Kantian tradition, including John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas, insist that political discussion should involve only the exchange of reasons on the ground that argument alone respects the rational autonomy of fellow citizens. This claim is not empirically plausible. When citizens actually meet to talk politics, they mainly tell stories. Nor is it normatively compelling. When I exchange stories, I respect my fellow citizens as seekers of meaning, just as I respect them as seekers of knowledge when I exchange arguments. With the recent explosion of scholarly interest in narrative, Political theorists are now debating whether telling stories is a justifiable way to talk politics. By contrast, politicians and political operatives have always appreciated the crucial importance of narratives. Some defenders of storytelling argue that the culture of argument favors the well-educated, while the culture of narrative is more inclusive. Others defend storytelling on the grounds that appeals to emotion can indeed be rationally justified. I aim to advance this debate by proposing a normatively compelling and empirically plausible division of labor between stories and arguments in political rhetoric. I will compare the logic of narrative to the logic of argument in order to show one, story and argument are the two most fundamental modes of linguistic thought and expression. Two, stories aim at creating meaning while arguments aim at creating knowledge. Three, understanding what political stances mean to those who hold them is as important as knowing whether they're true. 
Four, stories create the social trust necessary for productive argument. Five, in political talk, we should aim as much at understanding our disagreements as at reaching agreement. And six, knowledge is produced by expert argument, but diffused by stories. In response to false conspiracy stories, we need counter-narratives more than we need counter-arguments. So how do stories differ from arguments? Stories have beginnings, middles, and endings. Or, as Philip Larkin put it, beginnings, muddles, and endings. Arguments have premises and conclusions. Stories rely on anecdotes. Arguments rely on evidence. Stories connect events through time. Arguments connect propositions through logical inference. Stories aim at meaning, while arguments aim at knowledge. There are rules for good arguments, but no rules for good stories. Learning to make arguments takes decades of schooling, but even toddlers can tell stories. Argument is a science, whereas storytelling is an art. To see how stories create meaning, let's consider the difference between the telling of a story and the story told. The story of Franklin Delano Roosevelt usually features these four events. Birth into a famous and privileged American family, marriage to a brilliant and passionate young woman, crisis as he's stricken with polio in his prime, and triumph as he rises to become America's most beloved president since Abraham Lincoln. To tell this story, we might choose to start with his death, noting that he probably would not have become such a great president had he not faced the ordeal of his illness and disability. Or we might begin with his birth, noting that he was destined for greatness by virtue of his wealthy and politically well-connected family. Then again, we might start with his marriage, in which a seemingly superficial young man unexpectedly chose a serious and brilliant mate whose political knowledge and passions would be indispensable for his future. Or finally, we might begin with his struggle with polio, which most people, himself included, assumed would mean the end of his political ambitions. The story of Roosevelt's life can be told in any number of ways, each giving his life a different meaning. To ask which of these stories is true would be a category mistake. Storytellers create meaning by disclosing a compelling pattern in a chronological sequence of events. First, by selecting the significant events and characters, and second, by choosing the order in which to present the events, creating different interpretations of the same underlying story. Stories unfold in time, but the art of the storyteller is to arrange the events into a meaningful and timeless whole. We don't know how to start a story until we know how it ends. A story weaves a compelling pattern in which the beginning foreshadows the ending and the ending recapitulates the beginning. Narrative is the artful telling of stories about stories. Now, what is an argument? Philosophy as a discipline could be described as the science of argument. And philosophers describe any set of reasons in support of a claim as an argument. Arguments are externalized reasoning and reasoning is internalized argument. As Jean Piaget, a Swiss psychologist, put it, logical reasoning is the argument we have with ourselves. One could array all arguments on a spectrum from the weakest, which might be because of my horoscope, <laughs> to the strongest, which would be a mathematical proof. 
Arguments create knowledge by leading us reliably from what we already know to what we hope to know. Sometimes we know things that are quite general, and we use those general truths to learn about specific instances. Deductive arguments usually begin with the universal propositions and conclude with specific ones. So the famous example of a deductive argument, all men are mortal, a generalization about which we're fairly confident, combined with a minor premise, Socrates is a man, right? From, the, from those two premises, we can deduce that Socrates is mortal. But more often, we know specific things and try to generalize from them. Inductive arguments usually begin with specific propositions and conclude with universal ones. So we might start from, every swan I have ever seen is white. We might conclude that therefore all swans are white. We can see that all inductive arguments are merely probable. Right? It turns out that there are black swans in Australia. The fact that the sun rose yesterday and today does not mean that it will necessarily rise tomorrow. No amount of evidence can prove an empirical claim to be true. There might always be contrary evidence in the future. The paradox of seeking knowledge through argument is that the most compelling arguments usually establish only the most trivial truths. And what we most want to know is usually, is usually supported by the weakest arguments. Geometers can offer very impressive proofs showing that in a right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the square of the other two sides. Deduction usually serves to make explicit things we already know implicitly. If all tigers are cats, and if all cats are mammals, then all tigers are mammals. Maximal certainty usually implies minimal importance. Nothing is more exciting and less frequent than when deduction leads us to startling new knowledge. Induction, by contrast, regularly pr promises to lead us to important new knowledge. We might want to know if democracy has a political regime best promotes human rights. Well, we collect data and we use it to support our hypotheses. But support is not proof. Deduction is logically rigorous, but leads to insignificant truths, usually. Induction is at best only probable, but can lead us to very important truths. Perhaps the most common way to seek knowledge through argument is by what's called abduction, a kind of inductive reasoning that philosophers call the inference to the best explanation. Although Sherlock Holmes claims to use the science of deduction, most of his arguments are abductive in form. Right? Holmes begins with a puzzle, such as, when the intruder entered the stable, why didn't the dog bark? Then he uses his background knowledge of animal and human nature to draw a conclusion the intruder must have been known to the dog. Holmes's conclusion is not a genuine deduction because the minor premise, dogs don't bark at those familiar to them, is only probable, not certain. That is why Holmes treats his conclusions from abduction, his mere hypotheses, until he finds inductive evidence to support them. So Holmes right, starts with these abductive arguments and, and educated guesses, you might say, and then proceeds to look for empirical support for them. Now, stories and arguments are fundamentally different kinds of speech acts. And although they can be combined, they can never be blended. Many psychologists argue that stories and arguments are processed differently by the mind and indeed in different parts of the brain, right? They do these FRMI studies of, of, of the brain while people are reading stories versus people are reading arguments. And different parts of the brain light up with activity when you're reading stories from when you're reading arguments. So they think that arguments and stories are processed differently by the brain. So, sort of bizarre. 
Stories are more primordial and salient in human life than arguments because meaning matters more than truth. Meaning is a psychological necessity in human life, as important as food or water. Truth is felt to be a luxury. Human beings are obsessed with meaning. We look for meaning everywhere, and where we cannot find meaning, we project meaning. We distinguish clean from unclean foods and sacred from profane days or places. We sense emotions in the weather or faces in the clouds. We invest sexual difference with all manner of metaphysical contrasts, active, passive, hard, soft, rational, emotional, sublime, beautiful. We even turn the monotonous ticking of a clock into the meaningful sequence of tick and talk. Every tick anticipating its talk and every talk completing its tick. We live in a world colored by meanings, not a world of black and white facts. Jeremy Bentham claimed that the most basic human drive is to seek pleasure and avoid pain. But Friedrich Nietzsche rightly objected that human beings ardently seek pain and we carefully avoid pleasure so long as those pleasures and pains are meaningful. Think of the sacrifices and dangers people embrace in order to pursue a meaningful life. Many animals can rightly be said to seek pleasure and avoid pain. To be human is to seek meaning and to avoid meaninglessness. Now what about our common distinction between true and false stories or between nonfiction and fiction? When a journalist or historian calls their story true, they thereby signify a willingness to produce evidence that the characters and events depicted actually existed or happened. They may or may not include that evidence in their narrative because arguments clog up the storyline, but they at least must claim to be able to produce them. No historical or journalistic story is self-validating, no matter how true it seems. Only independent argument can distinguish true from false narratives. Stories are intrinsically indifferent to the distinction between truth and falsity. To call someone a storyteller, after all, is often a polite way to call them a liar. Some stories are indeed more truthful than others, but that truthfulness can be established only by independent argument. Studies in social psychology reveal that a vivid story is much more persuasive than a dull argument. Emotionally charged anecdotes are more cognitively salient than statistics. In this way, stories are like photos. They persuade by verisimilitude rather than veracity. Narratives, whether fictional or historical, do contain potential truths, but those truths are actualized only by independent argument. Champions of narrative often claim that stories can provide knowledge of causation, but no narrative can conceivably prove causation, not even the most carefully researched historical narrative. At best, stories can offer causal hypotheses, which must be tested by argument and controlled experiment. Stories, you might say, are pregnant with moral and causal truths that, can be that can cannot be delivered without the midwifery of argument. We are motivated to tell stories precisely to escape what seems absurd, monotonous, and confusing about real life. We then fall in love with our fictions and project them onto our histories and biographies so that life itself seems to offer tragedies, comedies, and romances. If stories were true to life, we wouldn't need them. We need stories to find and create meaning in our lives. We go wrong only in assuming that they're true. Now, we know what to believe 
only when we know whom to believe. In a world of specialized knowledge, we cannot always judge for ourselves what is true and false. We have no alternative but to trust someone's word. When we listen to an argument, our primary judgment is not about the validity of the reasoning, but about the speaker's credibility and character. That is why we instinctively doubt even a sound argument when we discover that the speaker has a conflict of interest. If we know that a speaker is being paid by big tobacco, logical rigor will be of no avail. According to philosophers, the soundness of an argument is independent of the character of the arguer. But in politics, people assess arguments in relationship to the credibility of the arguer. By contrast, we are persuaded by stories, this is again from experimental evidence, we're, we're persuaded by stories whether or not we find the storyteller credible. We give the storyteller, but not the arguer, the benefit of the doubt. Argumentative persuasion turns out to be ad hominem, but not narrative persuasion. When we don't know whom to trust, we're susceptible to conspiracy stories. I would say we live in a post-trust world more than a post-truth world. Because persuasion rests on trust in the speaker, the more that rhetoric relies on argument, the less persuasive it becomes. Arguments, like any artifact, reveal nothing reliable about the moral character of the maker. In fact, the more skillful the argument, the less we trust the speaker. <laughs> we associate genuine conviction with simplicity of speech and artful argument with sophistry. The oldest rhetorical trick in the book is to claim to eschew rhetoric and speak directly from the heart. We suspect the clever arguer of bad faith for two reasons. Either they use argument merely to rationalize their emotional commitments, or they deploy sophisticated arguments as mere sophistry unmoored in any genuine conviction. Moral fanatics make a mockery of logic, while lawyers make a mockery of moral conviction. The disjunction between argument and conviction becomes a yawning chasm in the case of proofs for the existence of God, which I take to be the very paradigm of bad faith. A speaker is credible only when we understand what led them to their convictions. We are usually sure that it was not by the force of logic. That is why testimonials inspire trust more than do arguments. Unlike Kant and his followers, Aristotle understood that the exchange of reasons rests on social trust. The first task of speakers, says Aristotle, is to show that they're worthy of trust. There are three dimensions, he says, of persuasive speech. First, inspiring trust in the character of the speaker, ethos. Second, appealing to the passions of the audience, that's pathos. And third, offering rational arguments, logos. These three dimensions form a nested hierarchy, says Aristotle. Trust in the speaker's character is a precondition for both appeals to passion and for rational argument. Rational argument, therefore, is the capstone of political discourse, not its foundation. Now, what is trust? To trust someone with something is to rely both on their skill and their goodwill. If I need someone to build my kitchen cabinets, I try to learn something about the special skills and honesty of particular carpenters. When I learn enough, to predict that they're reliable, I come to trust them. 
Trust based on knowledge is called strategic trust. But if I'm at the airport, if I'm at the airport and I need to use the restroom, I might trust a total stranger to watch my computer. Here, I have no specific knowledge, but I extend, I extend the courtesy of assuming that they're trustworthy, that we share a moral community of decent human beings. I treat them as I would like to be treated. This kind of social or moral trust in strangers has many benefits for democracies, not least in making possible the productive exchange of reasons. To be a morally trusting person is to treat other human beings as if they're also trustworthy, as if they're moral equals, unless I have strong reason to believe otherwise. Trust is a moral virtue because every act of trust makes us vulnerable to disappointment or betrayal. We signal this willingness to trust by greeting people with an open hand. Why do we accept the risks of moral trust? Because the only way to make people trustworthy is to trust them. How does a speaker inspire trust? We can make arguments to show that we have the, relative, the relevant knowledge and experience. But how does that prove good faith? Right? Trust in a speaker's moral character is more persuasive than trust in their knowledge or skill. It's paradoxical to attempt to argue that one is being sincere. That looks like a ruse. Claiming to be trustworthy inspires distrust. Right? As a precondition for the exchange of reasons, moral trust cannot be created by arguments. We need a totally different rhetorical strategy. And we see this in circumstances in which people want to be trusted quickly by a new community of strangers, whether a support group, a church, or a club. What newcomers always do is tell a story about their own foibles and struggles. Such testimonials, especially when they're not flattering, elicit the trust of others who are then often willing to tell their own stories. By offering a testimonial, I signal that I'm just like every other morally decent person, no better, no worse. Testimonials emphasize what we all have in common, not what distinguishes us. Advertisers and salesmen have always relied on the persuasive power of testimonials to sell their wares. Politicians also instinctively know that testimonials create trust when they begin their arguments by relating a personal story. It's common in America, I don't know about Hungary, but it's common in America for politicians before they begin their rhetorical arguments to offer a personal story. It again creates a bond with the audience. Canvassers, canvassers are people who go door to door attempting to persuade you of their views. Canvassers attempt to win support for their preferred policies and candidates, and they've learned a lot about how to cultivate trust quickly. Many of them have developed the practice of introducing themselves by telling an autobiographical story as a way to break the ice. These stories often focus on painful or embarrassing episodes in their lives, stories that help to explain how they ended up on your doorstep. Only after exchanging stories do these canvassers attempt to make their arguments. Empirical study of this, what's called deep canvassing, suggests that it's much more effective in changing attitudes and behavior than canvassing with arguments alone. The cooperative culture of storytelling creates the trust necessary for the combative culture of argument. In philosophy, an argument is a set of reasons in support of a claim. But in popular usage, an argument is a fight with words. When we say of a married couple that they argue a lot, we usually don't mean that they're constructing proofs. In the philosophical sense, I can make arguments alone in my study, 
But in the popular sense, it takes two to argue. These two senses of argument are connected. Since most arguments are merely probable, we cannot evaluate their strength except by confronting them with rival arguments. That is, we test arguments by arguing, by the contest of a debate. Philosophers may think that philosophical discussion and debate has nothing to do with fighting for domination, but that would be naive. Without a high degree of social trust, the exchange of reasons quickly becomes a fight with words. Argument becomes mouth-to-mouth -mouth combat. Argument is a blood sport. We should not be surprised that it drives people apart and even over the edge. Philosophers forget just how much human beings like to fight. Stories are created by the audience as much as by the teller. Listeners and readers are always co-authoring. A story is a bare score that becomes music only when performed by the audience. We follow a story by composing it. Storytellers want listeners to perform their own stories from the script. When people tell stories in conversation, their listeners often participate in the act of storytelling. We tell stories with other people, not merely to them. Arguments are designed not to elicit collaboration, but to compel submission. Arguments are designed to be self-sufficient. They fail to the extent that listeners must supply missing premises. Stories entice and seduce. Arguments hector and subdue. Stories bypass our usual resistance mechanisms. As I've noted, we give the storyteller the benefit of the doubt. Being challenged by an argument is like being challenged to a duel. We feel, cons we feel constrained either to yield or to fight. Arguments get our, our hackles up, while stories allow us to lower our defenses. That the culture of argument is competitive and combative is evident in the popularity of organized debates ever since ancient Athens. Homeric man-to-man -man combat became sophistic verbal duels. The culture of argument creates the agon in the agora so much admired by Hannah Arendt. Now the role of stories in politics goes far beyond creating trust in a speaker. Empirical studies of political discussion in deeply divided societies consistently shows that storytelling elicits more engagement and less animosity than does argument. The reason is that even when stories suggest a moral lesson, that lesson is presented indirectly. The ambiguity of the moral lesson conveyed by stories may help to overcome political division. By telling a story, I reveal what my political stances mean to me. And in politics, it's often just as important to know what a political opinion means to the person holding it as to know whether that opinion is true. At their best, arguments address opinions, not persons. And yet, by refuting an opposing position, we often end up dismissing the person holding it. That is why arguments on social media are so nasty. Interlocutors are reduced to 30, 30 character stances. But our fellow citizens are more than just bearers of political opinions. For all we know, they might have little interest in politics and might just be spouting opinions third hand. By exchanging stories, we express interest in the person, not merely their position. Even when I reject the opinions of my fellow citizens, I can better reconcile myself to them if I understand what those opinions mean to those who hold them. The exchange of reasons expresses respect for another person as a fellow seeker of truth. The exchange of stories expresses respect for another person as a fellow seeker of meaning. When we seek to understand another person, we must temporarily suspend the evaluation of truth. To understand another person is to attempt to inhabit their life world, to see how their experiences, 
Their choices and their opinions hang together. When our goal is understanding other people, argument is counterindicated. Understanding another person is a crucial first step toward trusting them. Many philosophers say that democratic deliberation should aim for principled agreement, sometimes called rationally motivated consensus. This goal, however, reveals their apolitical approach to deliberative democracy. If agreement were possible among citizens, there would be no need for politics, which is the practice of making decisions in the face of disagreement, usually by voting. Moreover, it's often impossible to distinguish principled agreement from sheer conformity based on intimidation, fatigue, or the desire to fit in. Disagreement is a feature, not a bug, of democratic deliberation. In moral and political matters, disagreement is normal. What needs to be explained is agreement. We should be suspicious of agreement. The Talmud, for instance, rejects all unanimous jury verdicts. Clearly, in those cases, something has gone wrong. Only tyrants receive 90% of the vote. Instead, we should aim for disagreement. To disagree is to oppose an opinion, not to abuse or threaten a person. It is absurd to say that I express my disagreement by threatening to kill you. Much of what passes for political discourse these days does not rise to the level of disagreement. If only we could learn to disagree. After all, accepting disagreements is often more likely to lead to compromise than the quest for agreement. A goal of political talk should be to understand our disagreements. If we better understand the meaning of other, political, other people's political views, we're more likely to reject their opinions rather than reject them as people. We cannot know whether a proposition is true until we know what it means. And we, and we cannot know how to respond <clears throat> to a moral or political argument until we know what it means to the speaker. Mutual understanding gained from the exchange of stories will often make the exchange of arguments more productive. Especially helpful in political conversation are dramatic stories of this form. I used to think that way, but here is what changed my mind. To understand is not always to forgive, but understanding makes it easier for us to forgive our political opponents for holding their obnoxious views. Abraham Lincoln attempted, uh, attempted to condemn slavery without condemning all its supporters by confessing that were he, uh, sorry, were he a Southerner, he would also likely support slavery. A healthy democratic public discourse requires mutual trust and understanding, which are the product of shared personal stories and a shared body of knowledge, which is the product of argument. Where trust is low, we should emphasize the exchange of stories. And where trust is high, we can focus on the exchange of arguments. Without storytelling, we can't understand why people hold the views they do. Without arguments, we cannot evaluate the truthfulness of those stories. Meaningful stories, I have said, trump meaningless facts. Poking holes in conspiracy stories will not sink them. We all prefer a leaky boat until a better one comes along. Whoever controls the narrative wins the argument. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back here, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, respond to my friend uh, Jim Murphy, who is, uh, I think, one of the uh, most uh, 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 well uh, developed uh, thinker on issues of uh, primary importance for us uh, uh, in our public debates. Perhaps. He did not uh, directly address those issues, but they were always there behind his thoughts, and I tried to elaborate it uh, 
uh, in my final point. I will make uh, five points. Uh, I try to be short, uh, but uh, uh, these are the steps that I would like to take. Four of them are four concepts that I would like to uh, bring uh, um, uh, forward. And the fifth one is again a concept, but uh, the one that uh, will uh, make it uh, easier perhaps to uh, understand the, what is at stake behind uh, this uh, story that uh, Jim told us about stories. Uh, so the first uh, uh, concept that I would like to uh, introduce is the concept of uh, language game. Uh, this is a concept uh, that uh, belongs to well, concepts do not belong to anyone, but uh, they are used uh, by, by many, but we attribute them to th those who uh, use them uh, in a, a very uh, uh, characteristic way. So the, the, the concept of language game was used by, by Ludwig Wittgenstein. And Jim uh, referred to, to the uh, concept of uh, the life world, uh, the Lebenswelt, and that uh, concept is connected uh, to the issue of uh, 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 the language game or Sprachspiel in German. What's the connection between them? Uh, if we have a language, we have got a community who speaks it. There is no private language. And if we have a community uh, who will use that language, then, uh, uh, because otherwise there is no language, again, uh, uh, that community lives the same sort of life. They have got the same w wealth, the same world that uh, they share with each other. Uh, the way of life will determine the meanings attributed to words. So I think that's, that's the crucial issue. If we want uh, to have uh, a meaningful political uh, debate, we need a community which can uh, share the meanings uh, of the words. And that's... Uh, uh, what we understand uh, through the concept of language game. So that's, that's the first concept that I, I um, uh, wanted to introduce. The second one is the concept of poetic justice. Uh, this is a term uh, which was uh, famously um, uh, used recently by the, the philosopher, ancient philologist, uh, Martha Nussbaum, uh, in a book uh, on the poetic justice and the public life. And why did uh, she use it? Uh, uh, her famous work is about uh, ancient uh, uh, dramas and uh, uh, their connection to uh, ancient philosophy. And Jim is, of course, uh, uh, a professor of, uh, of uh, ancient wisdom as well. So um, uh, that's the world that, uh, that uh, uh, he is also familiar with. And I think that the reason why he is so sensitive to this issue of uh, the difference uh, and the connection between argument and story is because of the ancients. And in particular, because the ancients attributed a special significance to the, the wisdom of uh, poets. Uh, and by poets, we mean uh, poets like Homer, who uh, told the stories, uh, uh, mythical stories or myths, uh, uh, creating mythology, but also uh, 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 dramatists, play playwrights like Sophocles. Uh, and all of them uh, did that uh, in order to teach that uh, community that they were uh, uh, members of. And what did they teach uh, or how did they teach? Through stories uh, to uh, have shared meanings. Uh, that's, that was their idea. So th the claim was that beyond the truth uh, of science or philosophy or, or argument, there is a, another sort of truth which uh, is connected to stories, which, which belong to stories. And we need to tell them in order to make sense of them. It's not the poet's justice, it's uh, poetry's justice. It's the, the justice of a work of art. Uh, and stories belong to uh, works of art. So that's, uh, that's the second term I wanted to, to introduce, the concept of uh, poetic justice, because I think uh, it shows us that uh, there is this tradition in, in uh, European uh, culture uh, to understand the justice beyond uh, philosophy, beyond uh, uh, arguments. The third one is uh, uh, the narrative unity of life, a concept uh, which uh, was famously used uh, by Alistair McIntyre, 
in uh, his work uh, After Virtue. And the concept of the narrative unity of life uh, tells us that uh, uh, whenever we want uh, to attribute meaning to something, we, we do it by relating it to our story of our own life. We cannot do any other ways, actually. We cannot uh, understand things in a neutral fashion, uh, in, a, in a life world. Uh, of course, the scientific discourse is something different, but uh, in ordinary speech, whenever we uh, want to understand something, when we attribute meaning to something, when we want to learn something, we will uh, have to uh, connect it to our own life and to the stories that we uh, tell uh, uh, about our own life. And whenever we uh, uh, come across with something, whenever something happens to us, or whenever we hear about something, we uh, will build that uh, element into our own uh, life story. That's, that's uh, the argument uh, about the narrative unity of life, which means that, in fact, uh, meanings can hardly uh, be shared uh, uh, totally uh, or in an absolute sense. Why? Because each of us will attribute different meanings because of our different ways of life. Jim is coming from the US, uh, from a very nice part of uh, the US, but uh, his story uh, uh, and his history is uh, quite different from uh, our one or from, for, from my own one. So uh, even if we try to understand each other, we will surely uh, not uh, uh, fully understand each other because of this uh, problem of the narrative unity of our life. And the fourth one, before my own one, is uh, uh, one uh, which uh, is attributed to Roger Scruton of whose uh, book I, I uh, uh, shared with you, um, uh, I mean my book on him, but uh, uh, that's because uh, I think that book has a lot uh, to do with, uh, with uh, uh, what uh, Jim is after here. Why? Because uh, Roger Scruton was uh, a philosopher of politics, or political philosopher, but also a philosopher of art. And uh, uh, these two things uh, did not separate in his mind. In fact, they uh, combined. How? Uh, that in his later life, uh, he came to the conclusion uh, that whenever he wants to explain his favorite uh, view of politics, which is the conservative uh, view of politics, what he does is actually telling stories. It's much uh, better and more uh, uh, convincing, compelling, than just uh, uh, throwing in arguments. Just to give you one example uh, how he did it is uh, to refer to his concept uh, of uh, oikophilia, of the love of home. He said that, well, uh, of course, conservatism can be described by, by political um, uh, uh, um, constitutional arrangements, uh, by, by uh, uh, particular um, uh, conceptual, uh, 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 terminological uh, uh, um, uh, arguments, but uh, the, uh, the important thing is to have convincing stories about uh, that particular worldview or political uh, uh, ideas. And conservatism uh, can best be understood, he claimed, if we understand that the human being is one who is after uh, in search of uh, a home where uh, he or she can feel at home, where uh, uh, everything is uh, 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 in comfort uh, for himself or herself, and uh, where uh, his or her life becomes meaningful. So this is a story, it has got nothing to do with politics, but it's, it sounds convincing for most of us, I hope, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh, apparently it does because uh, Scruton became quite popular. Now, what does all that uh, uh, has to do with, with uh, what uh, Jim was uh, uh, telling us? Uh, what is the connection between uh, 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 the, the concept of uh, uh, the uh, language game, of the concept of poetic justice, of the narrative unity of life, and uh, uh, oikophilia? It is uh, that, uh, in fact, if we want to understand politics, we have to understand this single a claim, and this will be, I hope, an argument, and uh, maybe that's easier than for Jim to respond, that uh, culture is upstream from politics. That's, that's the argument that I would like to make. 
I, in order to make sense of political issues, political debates, political crisis, and I would say that the West is uh, at present experiencing a political crisis, what we have to understand is what is at stake in our, uh, in our culture. Because without that, without, uh, in other words, understanding the basic myths, the myth mythologies that uh, 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 substantiate our uh, views of the world, uh, that gives us meaning uh, uh, for, for our political debates, we will not be able to solve the political problems. Uh, our divisions, uh, the culture war that we experience is based on the simple fact that our culture is divided. And, and if we will not be able to reunite uh, our culture, we will not be able to uh, 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 do politics in a uh, uh, reasonable manner. Why? Because as uh, 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 Jim uh, pointed out, of course, politics is about disagreement. Uh, so it's not about agreeing on, on major issues in politics that uh, I claim is important. But I think that we have to agree how to disagree. And uh, that's the second level agreement that uh, we are talking about. And that's what is determined by our culture. Uh, we need to be able to understand how the game of politics uh, is played what sort of uh, language game this is, and what is acceptable and non-acceptable in that. And I think that uh, to um, try to reach such uh, uh, an agreement, uh, a reconstruction of uh, an agreement on how to disagree, um, we need uh, uh, an education in civility. And that's uh, my present project. Uh, uh, which is uh, to, to re-establish what I call an Aristotelian framework of uh, civility, which is about uh, manners and, uh, and about uh, ways of life uh, that uh, belongs uh, to the citizen. Uh, and uh, the citizen in the Aristotelian sense is the man uh, of uh, uh, living a flourishing life in a community. And that's, that's uh, the job that... Uh, we educators are uh, uh, in particular responsible for. So I think that uh, there is no way out uh, of this uh, culture world without uh, learning again uh, how to tell stories and how to attribute meaning to those stories. In other ways, how uh, to uh, 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 get uh, to a, not an understanding, but a shared vision uh, of uh, our own cultural heritage. Thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to the book. Well, um, thank you. Uh, to, to follow those two um, presentations is quite a task, actually. So uh, that, was, uh, that was probably the, the uh, most sophisticated philosophical discussion uh, we've well, I've heard since we've been here, actually. So uh, the the area I'd like to address, and starting from uh, Jim's initial position of um, the fault, the problem of trust, and and how we understand a political condition based on trust. I think um, central to an understanding of rhetoric as it is, has been historically transmitted to us, is it, it exists really, and, and that sort of refers a bit to Faring's point, it exists almost um, uniquely in, in Western civilization. Um, in most uh, despotisms, which was the condition of most of the non-West from Greco-Roman times almost to the present, um, only one person spoke and the rest obeyed. It was the distinctive character of the Greeks and of the Roman Republic to enjoy speaking, to enjoy talk. Um, conversation was the essence of the Greek understanding, especially um, uh, what well, uh, my former uh, PhD supervisor, Ken Minogue, referred to them as the talkative Greeks. 
And um, conversation was central to the, not only political practice, but also to general practice throughout the culture, whether it was the theater or um, uh, music. It was always a, a conversational environment. So centrally then, before you can have rhetoric, you have to have a structure. You have to have, in other words, not a democracy necessarily. In fact, Aristotle and um, the Greco-Roman world was generally dismissive of, of democracy. Demos, um, ruled by the demos, demos kratos, usually meant ruled by um, emotion. Uh, emotions drove the people. The best form of government for Aristotle and going down really to the early modern world and to the uh, to our almost modern condition in, in figures as um, both Jim and um, uh, Ferenc quoted, Hannah Arendt, the political condition was a mixed condition in the 17th century in England. It was always the understanding of a mixture and balance of different viewpoints. And that understanding went right back to Aristotle when he's writing about the polity, saying it's not a single drumbeat. It's, it's a, a different voices coming together and, and through argument reaching a, um, a decision. And the decision might not even be final. I mean, the classic case used of this kind of reasoning, which is not abstract reasoning. It was always called soprosini by the, by the Greeks and prudentia by the Romans. And that prudential reasoning could be seen in, in sort of a, an example from Thucydides, where at one time, the, under the pressure of uh, oratory, the Greeks decide to um, destroy a city. And then on, on, on reflection, they reverse their decision. That doesn't seem like abstract reasoning. It just seems like uh, a set of arguments reaching to this seems a, a better outcome than what we previously thought of. So what I think is, is central to, to the condition of our, our discursive understandings is that the political condition itself is somewhat taken for granted, but we really need to reinterrogate why we live in political societies. And part of the problem with our modernity, with our um, end of history delusion, was that we thought Western values were universalizable and that a democratic condition was what everybody aspired to. It lost, actually, the idea of politics. And uh, you can even see it in courses that, no, you know, Jim, Ferenc, and I, um, when I started doing uh, political thought or introduction to politics, the, the initial courses were always on books like Bernard Crick's In Defense of Politics or Ken Minogue's Politics, an introduction. And central to that then was to understand that politics is not something that's a universal understanding. It's, it's very uh, contingent, and it was contingent upon developments in the West that created an appetite for interesting exchanges of views. The problem that we've got, I would say, is that understanding of persuasive discourse has largely been abandoned, that um, a lot of our argument doesn't even you know, aspire to the condition of argument. It aspires to the condition of uh, rage and protest. And in a book that I recently wrote on the strategy of Maoism in the West, um, and following some of the ideas that Alistair McIntyre outlined at, at various points, um, McIntyre argues in After Virtue, which has previously been mentioned, that um, 
part of the problem with a liberal modernity, not necessarily a political condition, but a liberal modernity, is it's faced with incommensurable values, the value of equality and the value of liberty. Uh, those values are uh, incommensurable. They can't be brought together. Rawls tried, but the, you know, the, um, the idea of behind the veilsville and, and reaching a, a, a common position of distributional justice strikes anybody with a sense of a, um, a, a narrative as absurd. So um, all, all that post-Kantian thought about um, commensurabilizing uh, values has broken down. So once you don't have um, a sense that you can commensurabilize, you can bring values together, you, McIntyre argues, and he noticed it in the 70s, but it's become more and more evident now, you, you clamp down on your position. Instead of saying, oh, I'll listen to the other side, I double down on my indignation against the you know, the lack of human rights or the um, lack of gender equity or the lack of transgender surgery being available, instead of being able to, you know, share the other person's position, actually anybody who holds a position different from you has to be slapped down. And, and it's done in ways that are not to do with classical understandings of argument, of persuasion, and the character of the speaker. It's done by abuse. And one, one of the things that um, McIntyre noticed, and which the political movements of the 60s and 70s took on from, was um, they took not from a Western discourse, but from an Asian one, from Mao, that liberalism is weak, it's soft, it likes to argue. If you're insistently outraged, if you um, resort to anger and denunciation, liberals tend to give in. And what we face at the moment is a problem of an inability to deal with um, not ethos or um, logos, but pathos in an extreme um, an extreme uh, uh, condition that, that we currently face. And um, it was interesting, you know, McIntyre noticed not only did rage double down and become the insistent condition which we now see daily on the internet, but protest took on a, a new dimension. A, prote a protestation in the 17th century was both... Uh, uh, an advocacy of something you 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 adhered to, as well as um, protesting against you know a, 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 a condition that you disagreed with. Now, however, protest is seemingly vindicated only by its rage, not by its arguments. So, uh, I don't disagree with anything that Jim or Frank said. I'm just worried that we're, even the narratives we have these days are not in any, any, any sense shared. So I'll stop there. Okay. So the question is whether, Jim, you would like to respond directly to our uh, comments or you would uh, take uh, some... Uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience. Sure. So, uh, Eric, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for these three uh, very insightful, fascinating uh, contributions. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on the on the cultural context and radicalize the direction taken by uh, David Martin Jones, who already was thinking in that, in that direction. I've written a PhD about the reception of American self-help culture in China. And my argument uh, towards you, uh, Professor Murphy, is that you're, um, you, you shed light on the importance of narrative and rhetoric. Mm. And I think that you touch upon topics that might be of 
partially of, of, of universal significance, but to a, to a large extent, you're also reflecting on something that's specific to American culture. So as a, as a Dutch person, the first time I went to the United States, I went to Berkeley, and then I later I went to the University of Chicago, I was absolutely shocked by Americans, the American focus on storytelling. So Americans would walk up to me and they, they, they're like, this is my story. What is your story? And I, I'm a Dutch person. Dutch people do not have a story. So I, I have a bullet point identity. So I would just be like, oh, what, what fact do you, would you like to know about my life, right? I didn't, I didn't have a story. Um, now, if you look up at the social scientific literature about identity formation and rhetoric, you'll notice that it's the American literature and the American influence literature that really puts a lot of emphasis on this, this kind of very expressive storytelling, right? And then when I was in China, actually, I worked in an industry at some point where the entire, which is fully specialized in training Chinese youngsters to prepare a narrative identity for, for when they go to the United States for higher education. So they start around age 15, 14. They get, they get tutoring by Americans. Uh, and they're trained until they're 18 to go to go to the United States. So the Chinese students that come to the United States usually been through a special training program of two or three years. And part of the story, part of the sorry, part of the part of the training is actually learning to tell stories and to see their own identity as a story project because that's totally un-Chinese. If you're a Chinese person, you do not have a story. So when Xi Jinping when he establishes his authority and his, his ethos as a speaker, um, he doesn't do it by telling stories. No one knows anything about Xi Jinping's personal life. He does it by through serenity and calm. How do, how do let's say, Germans, I, I lived in Germany for a long time, how do they establish their ethos? They usually uh, try to be very serious and start by defining things and opening up a conceptual space, much the way Ferenc structured his talk. So Ferenc started by explaining a few key concepts. That's how in, in a more German-centric or continental European context, you established your seriousness and your integrity as an intellectual. So, um, so the, question? the question is, <laughs> sorry, for, sorry for going on a bit of a lecture here, but the question is, um, isn't what you're saying about the, the, the storytelling as a centrality in rhetoric, isn't that a very American tale? And when is it a very American tale, then the fact that actually political trust is so low in America would indicate that storytelling might not actually um, necessarily produce the kind of trust. You link it to trust, but in the, in the big storytelling country of America, we have a lack of trust. Yeah. Well, great. Uh questions and interesting perspectives. It's something I'm have to think about, obviously. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, guess I do think that, um, that, that storytelling is a human universal, right, in the sense that anthropologists have never found a society where people don't tell each other stories and, and don't organize much of their social life around shared stories. I mean, even uh, the Dutch. Even the Dutch. I mean, the, <laughs> right, the, the Dutch have have their stories of religious conflict, of, the, of, of liberation from Spain. I mean, that is, uh, a, a nation just is a set of shared stories about a collective past. Um, on the other hand, I think you are onto something, something right in the sense that um, in, 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 you might, this, this gets the issue of the, the triumph of the therapeutic, right? Uh, that Philip Reeve talks about. So I think you're right that in America we see um, in the most pronounced form, a kind of therapeutic culture. Um, and now that is, that's spreading around the world. I don't, I don't think it's uniquely American, but I think it's, it's most pronounced in the United States, the culture of therapy. And in a therapeutic culture, there is a lot of emphasis on, uh, on, on telling your story, on, on, on explaining yourself and your, your particular passions and struggles and problems in terms of a kind of testimonial. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's in part reflects the, the American proclivity of storytelling in part reflects that therapeutic culture, uh, but also partly the kind of Christian evangelical culture, right? So it's a fundamental part of American Protestant e e evangelical culture 
that you uh, give a testimonial about how you came to Jesus, how you came to believe in Jesus, your second, your, your being born again, your second uh, birth. Um, so, 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 I, so I do agree with you. There are features of American culture that, that make storytelling especially pronounced. I think both the, the, the Christian testimonial and the therapeutic testimonial, I think, are especially prominent in America, even though I think storytelling broadly is a human universal. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm not going to give you my story. I leave that to <laughs> Harry and Megan. Uh, there's plenty of that around. It, the question uh, that intrigued me is the uh, question of trust that was raised by both speakers. And in order to be able to make democracy function, we have to be able to take on trust certain things that we don't believe. And this is not a story, but an anecdote. I was talking to a lawyer some time ago, and a case had just come up in Britain where somebody who, to all the general public, was clearly guilty, it was a question of a newspaper and phone hacking, um, had got off, as we say, on the technicality. And uh, I said, you can't, to this lawyer, you can't really believe this woman is innocent. He said, it is a fact that she is innocent, all right? This is a very lawyerly point of view, and my response to that was then, how is any appeal possible under law, which then establishes that they are indeed not innocent, or alternatively are innocent after conviction? Uh, that is one of the things we have to square in making so-called rule of law uh, work. Uh, the second point, the only three points I promise, is that the relationship between rhetoric and persuasion and objective truth, so-called objective truth, is again something we have to constantly balance out in our um, society. And I remember, <clears throat> I think it's David Hume, you're the philosophers, you'll correct me, who said that uh, the seat of reason is in the passions. And uh, a third point following on from that is to quote Mrs. Thatcher, who is considered to be a divisive and polarizing person by many. And uh, she said, people say, I should stand for consensus. She said, well, I have people in my cabinet <clears throat> who are very much in favor of consensus. And the result is that the least uh, productive solution to any problem, the greatest avoidance of any problem, results from our so-called search for consensus. Whoever won a great victory under the banner, I stand for consensus. I wonder if you'd like to comment. So, Jim, uh, you are a legal philosopher. Maybe you sh should take the, the, the first one. And, and I wonder if David would like to take the Hume and Thatcher issues, uh, which might be. Well, I'm now trying to moderate for oh. you. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. So, Jim. No, well, those were very interesting uh, observations. I, I guess, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the legal case, I try to make this. Oh, sorry. Oh, sure. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, in the realm of law, I think it's quite interesting that um, lawyers make arguments to judges, but they tell stories to juries um, because knowledge, the search for knowledge depends on expert argument, but uh, meaningfulness comes from storytelling. So they, they tell stories, they try to tell compelling stories to, to jurors. Um, and um, you, know, you say that whether... Uh, it's a fact that someone's innocent and so on. Um, but I think, um, you know, no, no, no scientist would, would, ever, would ever think of it that way. You can't, you can't provide uh, ex experimental demonstration of guilt or innocence, right? The, these, are, these are judgments based on the intersection between a compelling story about what happened and the, 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 and the structure of the law that, 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 that in their intersects with that story, so, um, so that's that. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I, I don't see how that could be established experimentally or in a compelling way. Uh, I think that just means that the uh, the, the, the stories 
told about the guilt or innocence or compelling or not. Um, and then, um, well, the seed of the reasons, yeah, it's Hume that said that the reason is a slave to the passions. Okay? Um, and uh, I, 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 I disagree with that, right? I'm more uh, Aristotelian in Greek. I, I believe that, that, that reason uh, is not just ho however much reason is sway can be swayed and un undermined and, uh, by the passions. Sometimes, though, passions can be educated by reason so that um, we're passionate uh, be for rational reasons, right? We're, 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 we have a passion of, of righteous indignation in the face of genuine injustice. So, so I think the passions can be educated by reason. They're, they're not uh, necessarily the masters of reason. Now, the moderator uh, wants to disagree with, uh, with uh, one of the... Uh, uh, um, uh, speakers, uh, so let me take the, the Hume one uh, as uh, David suggested that I should also take something on. Uh, so my, uh, my, my comment on the Hume issue is that yes, he says that uh, a reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, so that's a very strong claim. Uh, and I well, I understand why an Aristotelian is in a problem with that, and I am an Aristotelian in many respects, but I am also an admirer of Hume and then try to explain the thing. So I put the, all of that into my narrative unit uh, uh, of, of my life, and uh, I do it this way. Uh, I think that what here is referred to, that uh, we have got a mental makeup, uh, a cognitive uh, uh, universe, uh, which is uh, uh, determined by these different factors and, and the basic ones uh, is uh, more the, the, the passion-driven ones, which is, I think, not much uh, uh, far, not too far away from what you claim in your paper when you say that meaning uh, is um, uh, uh, prior to, to knowledge. Uh, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, what uh, in, in Hume's case uh, can be uh, the, the background supposition. Mm -hmm. and, and now, uh, David, what, what would you take on from the, the question repertoire? <laughs> I, I think you got the uh, authoritative position on Hume uh, <laughs> nailed down here. Um, the, the only thing I'd like to argue, you know, sort of suggest is that um, in terms of um, the, the, the law issue, um, the central, what we're talking about is a very Western and, in some sense, Anglo understanding of rule of law. And this is within the Western tradition, but I mean, it goes right back to the Greeks again that, you know, Aristotle's the condition of the polis was the condition of argument, and the arguments that were made led, leads to a decision of the polis that. These are the laws we should follow. It's rule of law, not rule by men. And in a lot of politics... As Aristotle explicitly claims. Yes, so. exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and the continuation of that is taken forward, particularly in English common law from really the medieval period. So, I mean, as long as the law is rule of law, where you are judged by a... Uh, 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 your peers in, 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 through jury trials, then the rule of law prevails, even if, you know, periodically they get the judgment wrong. Um, but I think the, the, the centrality, the central point is rule of law is, is a distinctive Western understanding that comes from the Greeks and continues into our current conditions. But elsewhere in the world, it's not, you know, China, Singapore, it's not really rule of law, although they've got the trappings of the British judicial system, there's no jury, and, and a judge decides. This is, as I've said, rule by law, not rule of law. And as for Thatcher, I think we should help hand over to John O'Sullivan here, <laughs> who, who, who would argue that um, she, she certainly wasn't about consensus, but she was about argument, but argument being um, made clearly and persuasively with, with facts, not with passions, leading to interesting disagreement, which can lead to productive decisions. But John might want to add. 
<laughs> okay, so we have got two other questions, one from here and one from there, and I think that's, uh, and, and finally by John, and then we will Cross. call it a day. Hi, first of all, a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Like usual, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. Um, I'm here for a very basic reason, besides seeing you all, is that tell me your story and then I'll listen to your argument. I'm one of millions of people, let's say Americans, I'll put aside the rest, that are conservative and between you and me find basically impossible to have any arguments or discussions with liberals, progressive and woke people in the United States. Contradict me if you want. I have it on my own skin. I talk to many other people. I came here among other things to hear what solutions do you have? Have you, I mean, try talking. I, I'm coming from another meeting right now where uh, from academic freedom, it degenerates on the subject of trans, bank. You try to discuss that with somebody. So this all sounds very nice. It's very studied. You guys have very learned people. I don't even want to touch on Aristotle, even in Thatcherism. How can you handle that? It's okay, so you can't argue. So you can't argue what story can. I can tell stories about my life to my son or to other people. BS, it's not important. Uh, Bernie Sanders, socialism is not what you think, Dad. I come from a communist country. So what we try to accomplish is not for you. And this is not only to me. This must have happened to other people in this room. And probably must have happened to you if you yourself are conservative. What's your solution to this? <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> solution in one uh, sentence? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I have found that in, in, in talking to people that I disagree with politically, uh, I often ask them, you know, what, what caused you to think that? Why do you think that way? What, what, what makes you hold that? And, and they tell me various experiences they've had, uh, various um, things have happened in their life that, that, that persuaded them. So, it's not, that I, it's not that I agree with them after I hear that, but I, I, I understand better why they think that way. So provoking. Pardon? You provoking. Well, I don't think I'm provoking. I'm just trying to understand why they think the way they do. And, and when they tell me their experiences, I have a better idea why you would think that. Before, it was just puzzling why you'd think that. But once I hear the story, your life experiences, then I can understand better why you think that way. So again, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to agreement. It leads to understanding disagreement. That's the goal, is understanding disagreement. That's a good point. Thanks. Uh, next one, and then uh, John. Uh, okay. Okay, then John. <laughs> uh, thanks. I, I have... Um, wait, wait. My question is about drama, which is, of course, one of the ways in which you tell stories. Yeah. And, um, and I'm thinking in particular, which also is, of course... Uh, uh, the, the Greeks invented for that purpose. Um, I'm thinking of Antigone, but not the Sophoclean version, the, the, and, uh, the one that the treatment of it by uh, Jean Henri, the French dramatist. When Antigone um, um, came out in Paris, the Nazis were still in control. They allowed it because they thought that he gave Crayon good arguments. Um, it then carried on and ran from 1944 in Paris until 48. Um, it then transferred to Broadway and it ran for several years in Broadway. And of course, um, Jean on we established a reputation, uh, which I think fully justified being one of the greatest of French dramatists in those years in, at that point. Now, I think that that's what I've just said is a wonderful uh, is the complete opposite of council culture and a wonderful refutation of it. And my question is, um, am I right? And if so, why? And the second question, and the second bit of it directly made to David is, at the end of this wonderful debate, debating argument of a play, uh, aren't we more or less allows Antigone to argue that, and remember, the, both of them reject the idea of the gods. It's about us here and now. And secondly, they both say, well, we don't know which, son, which brother is, in the, is lying uh, dead there and which is the, the hero brother. We just don't know. And um, so which one we bury is kind of irrelevant, really. But at the end of this, um, Crayon has argued 
um, uh, the, for the peace of the city, we have to do these things, uh, bury one and not the other. And, and um, Antigone argues, really, her argument, which seems to be endorsed, anyway, it's the popular view that this is the, an endorsement by the playwright, is that saying no to Crayon is itself the justification of her action. That it is, that protest itself, the ability to say no, um, is the key thing. It's not quite the same, yes, but the ability to protest is the, is the key thing. What do you think about that? Okay, first you, and then David. Okay, great, that was interesting. Uh, yeah, I love, the, I love the play Antigone, and uh, I guess I think that it, um, one aspect of it that speaks to our co contemporary situation, I think, is that, um, and, and I always point this out to my, to my students, is even though Antigone's position and Creon's position are, are diametrically opposed, um, they're very similar characters, right? They're, they're, they're both utterly convinced uh, of their own truth. They have a total failure to listen to the other. Antigone never uh, em empathizes with Creon. She, she never thinks, well, gosh, to, you know, to, to have the responsibility to run a city and, and to unify it. Sorry. Yeah, to, to, that, that she never sees his point of view. That, that being a statesman, he's going to look at the situation quite differently from the way she looks at it as being the sister uh, uh, of the Polynices. So, uh, so I, I think what's interesting in terms of the dialogue of the deaf, I mean, that's how I describe the Antigone versus Creon. It's Isamene, right? It's, 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 it's her sister. It's the only character in the, in the drama that, ex that conveys an ability to listen to what other people are saying and I understand the, the different points of view. So I, I think it is a great play about our political moment of this dialogue of the deaf. Thanks. David. Well, uh, Jim's answered the question, I think. Um, I'll go with him. Now, the only other thing I'd um, probably throw in there is that um, <coughs> also, you know, the, the Greeks were prepared to put up with... Um, perspectives, you know, so there's a perspective of Cleon, there's a perspective of Antigone. And, and that tends to translate itself into later styles of thinking about the political. I mean, for some reason, Machiavelli comes to my mind, you know, that there's the perspective from the, the demos, and there's the, well, there's a perspective from the piazza, and the perspective from the palazzo. And they often uh, don't coincide. And Machiavelli was as good a playwright as he was a political thinker. Um, so I, I think what's the, the virtue of drama is, is that it presents moral challenges and political challenges in, 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 a, in a form that, again, is, is distinctively Western and that, by its very practice, um, leaves an audience with a sense of awe, really, at um, the, the human condition. So it, it, it's that exploration of the human condition that the Greeks were so brilliant at, and which lent itself to our later civilizational discourse, from which were tragically beginning to fall away, perhaps because of the triumph of the therapeutic. I cannot, I cannot uh, uh, stop uh, uh, trying to, to bring my own story here. Uh, and that's, uh, that's concerning um, the, the role and function of uh, theatric performances uh, in political debates when uh, those political debates are constrained. And I think that in those uh, situations, it, yeah, it might have a different function than in well um, um, operating um, uh, democracies uh, or, or uh, parliamentary regimes. And uh, what I have in mind is, of course, my own country. <laughs> and um, uh, in those days when uh, it was uh, uh, under a totalitarian rule. And I take two examples. One is a performance. The other one is a theater. The performance was uh, that of uh, a play by Shakespeare uh, uh, entitled uh, Hamlet. And the performance was... Uh, 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 connected uh, to 56, 
which was the, the famous uh, um, 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 revolution, uh, 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 war of uh, liberty in, in Hungary. And uh, that performance uh, by, by uh, Miklos Gabor, who was the most prominent uh, actor in those days, was uh, a symbolic uh, uh, gesture towards uh, uh, that uh, revolution uh, without any direct reference. And everyone understood that this Shakespeare is about that particular political issue uh, without uh, any uh, arguments uh, uh, pointing towards that direction. So the story uh, uh, gave that uh, powerful political uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, influence uh, to, 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 to that performance. And the other one is a, a, a theater, as I mentioned, the theater in the uh, 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 well, uh, middle uh, 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 range uh, city in the countryside uh, called Kaposvár. That theater was uh, a, a hotbed of uh, opposition thought in the 70s and 80s. And uh, it uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, people, mostly students uh, and intellectuals, who traveled daily from Budapest or from other parts of the country to, to Kaposvár to see a performance there. Because that was uh, the piazza, the, 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 uh, the agora, or the forum of, of uh, a totalitarian regime, a theater where you could uh, see classical uh, performances or modern ones, uh, uh, one of them uh, 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 taking place in a, 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 a hospital, a, a madhouse. <laughs> and and uh, the interesting thing was that everyone uh, always uh, kept uh, reading or, or understanding those uh, performances in this uh, political framework. And as I mentioned, uh, Kaposvár played a major role in uh, articulating an opposition position uh, against the totalitarian regime. So two examples which tell us that uh, uh, telling stories uh, can be more uh, important than, than just arguing against uh, anything. Um, well, is this working? Yes, it is. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, well, not first of all, I'll come back to it. Um, the last question and the three replies have um, persuaded me on the spot to make a decision about the future programs of the Institute. David and I have been discussing, which I think we will be doing, um, a series of film nights in future. Um, and we've thought in terms, and I think we will do this to uh, uh, discussions of the political aspects of uh, film noir. But it occurs to me that there are some wonderful plays and films of debate and, and, we, and uh, plays which are caught on camera, certainly. Um, and I think, uh, for example, we've mentioned Henri's uh, Antigone, or maybe The Lark, but also I'm thinking of the plays of Bernard Shaw, uh, not just St. Joan, but plays like um, um, Arms and the Man. Uh, no, sorry, not Arms and the Man, uh, the one about uh, the armaments manufacturer, which is a different play. <laughs> um, I, I think if I may just invite all of our three speakers tonight to be back for one of those evenings, I think we would all like to be here to hear what they have to say about them, um, which leads me on now to thank them for being here today. Now, one of the conventions that the Greeks have left us is that of good manners, and I forgot mine, I'm afraid, and when I failed to welcome Kirsten, um, uh, our main guest wife here, so thank you for being here, and thank you uh, for... Um, um, being, uh, bringing your husband here and allowing us to en enjoy his company, which uh, obviously we have done, and uh, very much so. So on behalf of all of you, I would like to thank um, Jim uh, and the other two speakers, of course, obviously, Ferenc, an old friend, and uh, of course, a, a colleague, David. Uh, it's been a very a good evening, full of good ideas, many of which were completely new to me. And there aren't many new ideas, one has to say. So, so thank you very much indeed. And, uh, and now let's enjoy a drink. All the best. Thank you.